And from the national stage to some interesting localities, we're going to take you now. Uh, we're going to be speaking with Madeline Barron. She's an investigative uh, reporter for APM Reports. That's the national investigative team of American public media. Published an amazing uh, broadcast, a podcast, uh, In the Dark, um, in 2013, 2014, which uh, really established the um, malefactor in a, one of the most explosive and best known cases in the state of Minnesota. Uh, Jerry Mitchell, investigative reporter at the Clarion Ledger in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, his reporting has helped put a number of Klansmen behind bars. Um, he is both an acknowledged MacArthur genius and a, quote, evil shrimpy reporter. That would be, <laughs> that would be in the words of the serial killer that he helped to put behind bars. Um, and Connie Walker, an award-winning investigative reporter from uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation and the 2016 host of an eight-part podcast on missing and murdered, the disappearance of indigenous women in, uh, in Canada in truly unbelievable numbers. So we're going to let each of these panelists introduce their own work with a bit of a video and speak about it, um, and then have a little back and forth, and then audience question and answer. So Madeline, why don't you begin? I think you're going to start with showing a video. Yeah, so we'll just show the video first, and then I'll talk a little bit um, after that. My favorite food is steak. My favorite color is blue. We believe that they have one of the boys because the, one of the boys did not come back with them. I wake up at night thinking about it. Law enforcement not only blew it back then, but they blew it in 2004 more than ever. There has to be an element in there to have accountability. And when accountability is not there, disastrous things happen. It was literally within a minute that they biked by our house that they were stopped up that hill. It was within a minute. I'm not going to concern myself with the things that weren't done by the investigators more than 25 years ago. Such a small fraction of sex offenders end up on a registry. And I can tell you that most of the suspects we've had in Jacob's case would never have been and never were on a registry. So there's a false sense of these are the bad guys. It's like we're regulating nuclear waste. We're not punishing the nuclear waste. We are making sure that it's kept away from us at a safe distance. How many of these types of psychopathic pedophiles can exist in this 15 to 20 mile radius? I mean, was it more than one? Was there something bigger going on? Over the next eight weeks, we're going to look at the Jacob Wetterling case in a way that it hasn't been looked at before. Not to solve it, but to try to find out why it hasn't been solved. We're going to look at what law enforcement did and also what they didn't do. And we're going to see how those decisions would come to damage the lives of so many people in ways that no one talks about. I haven't done what I set out to do. That's the part that hurts. So this was a product of a, about a year or so worth of reporting by a team of reporters. Um, I was a lead reporter and host of the podcast. And um, the way that I got started in it, so in Minnesota, this is a notorious child abduction case, and this is the biggest news story of all time in Minnesota. Um, but also, this was a case, the abduction of Jacob Wetterling, that led directly to the federal law that says that all states have to have registries of sex offenders. So now there are about 800,000 or so adults on sex offender registries in this country, and you can trace that line back to this case not being solved. Um, and this is one of a handful of cases that fueled this narrative of stranger danger in the 80s and 90s. Um, and I wasn't, I'm not somebody who is like obsessed with crimes, like I don't watch horror movies. I'm, it's just not at all like a genre of something I'm interested in, the crime itself or the details. So I really, I wasn't from Minnesota and I didn't know the details of this case. And I just ended up reading about it one day while I was working on something else. And like I say um, in the podcast is this, immediately was surprising to me because this was a case, um, it's one of the largest searches for any missing person in the history of the United States. 
the FBI was involved, local law enforcement, the governor called out the National Guard, and 27 years had passed without it being solved. So I expected that this crime would, would be the perfect mystery. I mean, that the facts of the crime must have been such that it would be really difficult to solve. And right away I read that, okay, well this crime happened in a, on a dead end road. There were two witnesses, um, town of 3,000 people. The kids ran right away and called the police. The police got there right away. So what happened? So the, the question was very simple, is why hasn't this case been solved? Um, and I think what is different about the question that we were asking um, is we weren't trying to solve it. You know, there's a lot of reporting on crime that seeks to solve it, and what we thought was important here is to say, no, we know whose job it is to solve crime. They're called law enforcement. So are they solving it? And as investigative reporters, we need to ask the question of law enforcement sometimes and not just jump in and try to do this ourselves. Um, and so over a year's worth of reporting, we found that um, the, the lead investigative agency in this case, um, the Stearns County Sheriff's Office, had botched the case, that they had failed to do some of the most basic police work. For example, they hadn't talked to all the neighbors who lived near the abduction site. So at the same time that there was this massive coverage and there were thousands of people combing the fields and they were you know, going to other states to talk to psychics, they hadn't just gone up and down the street and talked to people. Um, with disastrous consequences. They had also, um, the sheriff had called an innocent man who, a person of interest in the case, and not just an innocent man, but the only adult witness of any value in this case who saw a car, he lived right next to the abduction site, drive around and leave. Um, and so this case had been, so we showed the case had been botched, but then what we wanted to show was, it's not just about this one case. So we went and looked from 1970 to present day in the sheriff's office, how good of a job do they do solving crime? And that involved the work of not just myself, but a whole team of reporters, a data reporter who worked on this for months, who had to go get like paper documents of the clearance rates for this central Minnesota county. And what we found is that this sheriff's office has a very poor track record of solving crime. Like for example, last year, um, or in 2015 rather, their clearance rate for violent crime was 12%. So that sounds bad. It is bad. <laughs> but what's worse is that there are law enforcement agencies across this country that do an even worse job of solving crime. And no one hears about that. And so we expanded then toward the end of the podcast to tell this larger story. You know, how is it that in a nation that seems to be obsessed with crime, obsessed certainly with the crime rate, once those crimes happen, we don't seem that interested in whether or not law enforcement is solving them. And if we are interested at all in those cases, we tend to be interested in, you know, like we all know these shows, right? We are interested in like the, the devious criminal that could have done this or the perfect crime. And so we become obsessed with like the details of the crime. We become obsessed with the criminal. But we are not interested in law enforcement, like in the, the government agency that's supposed to be solving these cases. So what we did was take this one case, this like small town, big consequential case, very consequential to the people involved, but then also told this much larger story about something that we think um, is, a, is a big problem in the United States that isn't getting as much attention as it could be. I think it's a common thread, and you'll hear it now through all of these stories, that these are seemingly stories about crime, but they're really stories about criminal justice. You know, at the Marshall Project, we cover criminal justice, and we're very conscious of the difference between those two things. It's about law enforcement not doing its job. And you, you will talk a little later, I think you have some choice words to say about what a reporter is and what a police officer is and why you should not confuse those two. But Terry, let's move to you for a minute. All do right. you want to show your video first? Sure, or, show or set show it up, video. whatever you want to do. Roll the clip. Roll the clip. <laughs> A man named Felix Dale grew up on a dairy farm in Montpelier, Mississippi. In 1961, he married homecoming queen, Mary Horton. A little over a year later, she drowned. In 1970, he met Sharon Hensley, brunette beauty who had modeled. In 1973, Sharon Hensley disappeared. In 1983, Felix Dale married a teenager named Annette Craver. A year later, she disappeared. These women were all last seen alive with Felixville. 
great. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I don't have to say anything. That's it. Anyway. It's a lighthearted. That's a little lighthearted story. I think that. Um, I, I got uh, I got a phone call one day. Um, someone heard me on the radio talking about the Mississippi burning case, which was another case I worked on, and. Um, it was a mother, and the first thing she asked me was, would you be interested in writing about a serial killer living in Mississippi? And my answer was, well, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, she decided to come to Mississippi. She wanted to confront Felix Vale. Felix Vale had never been prosecuted, and this, the first wife's death was in 1962 in uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana. And so, Anyway, he, anyway, he had never been prosecuted, nothing had ever happened to him on any of these cases. And so uh, she wanted to confront him about these three women, Annette, this is Annette's mother. And so she decided to come to Mississippi. I was like, to want to confront him, I'm like, I want to go with you, you know, because I mean, obviously it's a good story. And so I go with her. He lived in a real remote area of Mississippi, if you know where Starkville is, it's about a half hour north of there in Mississippi. So we, we drive out there, real remote area, nothing around. And, and so I'm with her, and the gate's locked, and she hops over the gate. <laughs> and so I followed her. <laughs> and we walk down this trail, and it's just all tall weeds and everything. And finally, we get this clearing. And there are like two trailers. One, I can tell, is like an old trailer or something. that has like the plywood across the, the front. And, uh, but the other trailer's new. And so she goes to the new trailer, silver trailer, knocks on the door, no answer. Well, I'm just starting to try to look at the surroundings here, you know? <laughs> and, you know, see all the woods that are around us. And all of a sudden, the next thing I look up and she's heading for the old trailer. And so I go back, go that way. And next thing I know, she's climbing in the back of the trailer. And then she opens the front door, so now I can see in. And she starts rummaging around. And all of a sudden, she throws out a machete. And then another machete. And then another machete. And then all these swords. And I'm thinking, what have I gotten myself into here? <laughs> so uh, that was spring of, of 2012. Uh, she had a whole stack of newspapers and other kind of documents she had, not only on her own daughter, but some of the other women as well. One of them was, that stood out to me immediately, was she had an autopsy of the, uh, for his first wife. So what I did with that during my process of beginning to look at this was shared that with Dr. Michael Bodden. I kind of got to know Dr. Bodden because he did the autopsy in the Megar Evers case and sent it to him and he came back to me and said, this is a homicide. I mean, she was, she had a scarf in her mouth, um, bruise on the back of her head, bruises on her legs. Um, and I guess the seven, so I ended up writing, a normally typical investigative reporter, I, I don't, I, I like narrative, but I don't do it very often. Um, but in this case, I felt like that was really the only way to tell the story. And it was also a way to not even have to say he's a serial killer. You know what I mean? I just tell the story. And so I just kind of embedded my investigative reporting within the story. It was almost 9,000 words. And it was literally, we printed it just as a special section. And it ran in the newspaper. And seven months later, he was arrested in Louisiana. So uh, he was actually in the middle, by the way, of the reporting while I was working on this. He left. And uh, no idea where he went. But I found him uh, in Texas. So anyway. Uh, <laughs> Canyon Lake, Texas, and uh, anyway, so he got arrested seven months later and just got convicted this past August and sentenced to life in prison, so, wow. yeah. <laughs> Connie, you were on a murder trail of a different sort. Do you yeah. want to tell yeah, us about I, that? Yeah, if we play the video first, that's a, a good introduction as well. That's Alberta Williams. The tip that sparked this story just showed up in my email one day. The subject said, Alberta Williams murder. She was murdered by Why did I hit send? Because it was the right thing to do. When you called me back, I almost didn't even know if I should answer the phone. Because it was like, oh my God, what have I done? It's been 27 years since Alberta vanished from downtown Prince Rupert in Northern British Columbia. 
Alberta didn't just go missing. She knew the person, she trusted the person. Alberta's body was found three weeks later, hidden in the woods next to the Skeena River. If I didn't turn my head away, she would be here. Now people who have never spoken publicly are opening up. Some of our immediate family members were a person of interest. Were you afraid to go to the police? Yeah. I just had to be quiet. We've tracked down people who were with Alberta on the night she disappeared. Were you with her that night? Was she at your house? Some people think you might have been involved, were you? Why didn't you want to give your DNA? It's my choice. But who were never interviewed by police. She had been carrying a blanket or something or looked like a body in there. Who was carrying the body? <laughs> Missing and murdered. Who killed Alberta Williams? Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Wow. Thanks, yeah. Um, so a lot of really common themes, I, I feel like, uh, on the panel. But I mean, this is uh, our, our podcast or our website about Alberta Williams, who was 24 when she was killed in 1989. And the highway that you see in the trailer is uh, a highway in northern British Columbia that's now known as the Highway of Tears because of uh, the large number of Indigenous women who have gone missing or have been found murdered uh, along the highway. And RCMP, who are the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Canada, have long suspected a, a serial killer has been targeting women uh, on that highway. And the guy who sent the email sa saying he, know who, he knew who killed Alberta is actually a former RCMP officer who is now retired. And he was one of the lead investigators in Alberta's murder in 1989. And he had just has never forgotten her case because he felt like they always knew who was responsible, uh, but they just had never had the evidence to, to charge this person. So our podcast is very much a deep dive into this one case in particular and tracking down people who knew Alberta and were with her the night she disappeared and trying to find out some answers about her death. But I think really it's about the bigger picture of uh, Indigenous women in Canada and the disproportionate rates of violence that we face. And I say we because I'm also Indigenous, I'm Cree. I grew up on a reserve in Saskatchewan. And you know, this issue is really the reason that I became a journalist. Um, I was in high school during, um, in, in 1996 or 1995, when a, a, another Cree woman was killed in Saskatchewan and uh, it was a very high profile case because two white university students uh, in Regina were charged in her murder. And there was so much media coverage of the case and a lot of it focused on them, uh, about how they had bright futures ahead of them, about how you know they were really good boys and uh, keep in mind she was a sex worker, you know, was actually an instruction that the judge gave to a jury when, when considering her consent uh, to going with these, with these two guys. And at the time, I remember feeling like there was no Indigenous voice being represented in this mainstream media. And so that was why I, I decided to, that I wrote my first article for the school, school paper. Um, and for a long time, no one was interested in missing and murdered Indigenous women. It's really only been in the last couple of years that this has started getting attention in Canada, even though it's been an issue that's been ongoing for decades. Um, the RCMP had released a report uh, in 2012 saying um, t uh, just about 1,200 Indigenous women across the country had been missing or murdered. They had a list of, of women. <laughs> And advocates who have been doing this work for a long time, they believe that number is actually much, much higher. And so at CBC News, what we decided to do, uh, because the RCMP didn't release any of the names or details, many details about the women, um, certainly not any of the circumstances uh, about their lives, we c compiled a database um, that was really the precursor to the podcast where we now have over 300 cases uh, profiled on our database, and it's of Indigenous women whose cases are still unsolved. 
And what we tried to focus on was not just the violence or the circumstances of their death or disappearance, but really try to show the humanity and to show who they were and how they lived. And we interviewed their family about, and that was Alberta's sister that you saw in the trailer. And we wanted to try to illustrate you know, that every single one of them has a family and a community that loves them and is still mourning their death and wants to find justice. And that sounds really basic and simple, right? But for a long time, um, you know, there's just been such an emphasis on, you know, vulnerabilities or high-risk lifestyles or things that, that, that have dehumanized Indigenous women in mainstream media. So, so as an Indigenous woman, that has really been a priority of my reporting for the last few years, I've been focused on this issue, um, not just telling Alberta's story, but other stories as well as a part of the database. Um, but that was a huge part of our podcast, was trying to tell people who Alberta was and to show how much, even 27 years later, how much her death has impacted her family and her community. I think I read that if the murder rate for Indigenous women were generalized to the Canadian population, it would be 18,000 yeah, I mean, killed. Indigenous women are rate. Th yeah. three times more likely to go missing, four times more likely to be murdered, and we, you know, Indigenous people as a whole make up less than 2% of the Canadian population. So it's, you know, it's, it's very, and, and part of the podcast is actually trying to show how this does not just exist in a silo, that this is connected to this legacy and this history um, of the relationship between Indigenous people and Canadians and, and the Canadian government. And kind of dive deep into painting a picture of how this reality came to be because it's been so underreported in Canada and it's not something that's taught in schools. It's, you know, the, the legacies that, that people have uh, been dealing with are still largely unknown. It's been much more widely reported since your podcast and yeah. that's one of the things you've really turned around. I mean, I think the question that just immediately comes to mind is what happened to the cops? How did they mess this up so badly? And I think the answer is a little bit different for each of you. I mean, Jerry, in your case, you know, the FBI at one point gets interested in the case, right. but then they kind of they don't have it. the yeah. resources. The FBI's got to have more resources than the Clarion Ledger. I don't know yeah. how well you guys are doing. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I found interestingly in my in my journey, I was, you know, I was kind of digging through looking for grand jury stuff, you know, uh, with regard to what happened with the grand jury back in '62, and, and why didn't they indict? And you know, it was pretty obvious, you know, from the photographs, et cetera. Um, and so I, I just, this is to let you know, uh, I think they were talking earlier about the story and, uh, about how you kind of end up going down a different trail sometimes. You, you kind of go down this trail and it takes you down another trail. So I was just literally going through looking for grand jury stuff and I'm just going through the, the docket, you know, and the, the, you know, kept my hand back then and just kept noticing all these cases that got dismissed by the district attorney's office. And then I started, it was so many criminal cases dismissed by the district attorney's office in Lake Charles. And, I, and so then I thought, I'm just going to count them. And so it was 882 criminal cases in the year of 1960. Lake Charles is not a big place. 882 criminal cases. And so I reported that. And then... Um, I also found out of there was a connection between Felix Vale, the, the serial killer, and uh, and his family and the district attorney's office. Oh, that, wow. And so I actually literally went and visited Felix Vale's aunt was living in a nursing home, and I found this out. So I just went to go visit her in the nursing home. <laughs> Came in in time for lunch. Uh, <laughs> And just sat down and just started talking. And of course, I'd already talked to everybody in her family. Uh, I literally talked to everybody. And a lot, most of them talked to me, by the way. Uh, only Felix didn't talk to me. But uh, who accused me, by the way, of making all this up and got it all from uh, James Patterson novels. So anyway, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I went in and talked to her and, and I just asked her about the district attorney. And with the district attorney's dad, where I found this was I got a great researcher 
for the local library. I highly recommend that, especially if you're working on something cold case, that pre anything pre-internet, I guess you could say. And he was so willing, he would go deep dive into all of this stuff. Like he would pull up the city directory for me. He'd pull up old obituaries for me. Well, he, I, he sent me the obituary for the district attorney's father. Well, that's when I found out the district attorney's father worked for the same plant with Felix Vale's uncle, who was a supervisor at the plant. So I, I suspected a relationship there, and I went in and asked her, and oh yeah, we were such good friends with them. <laughs> right, right, right. So I had my story. There um, you go. Yeah. Madeline, I, I, you said, you mentioned earlier that this was a law enforcement was hiring psychics and mm -hmm. not interviewing the neighbors. Right. Um, this is really a story of police wow. work gone awry. Mm -hmm. Why, why were, I don't know, why were they so damn bad? What's your theory? What went <laughs> wrong? Well, I think that what we found when we looked back starting from 1970 through, this crime happened in 1989, through the present day was that this was a sheriff's office that had like almost a philosophical aversion to looking backward. Even though the sheriff himself is Mr. Looking Backward, I mean, he runs the jail, right? I mean, he's punishing people, but for himself and for his sheriff's office, he doesn't believe in it. You know, so he, and, and both the sheriff and then many other law enforcement officials too would say this, that there's no real point to looking backward. So I think that there was something that happened over time when every time you have a case that's not solved, Instead, I mean, because we can all make mistakes in whatever our job is, but if every single time that happens, you say, I'm, I, like, you refuse to, to look at that and see what you could have done differently, lessons for next time, there's like a cumulative effect. But the other reality is that nobody looked at this. I mean, the share, so one of the things that we did was something that hadn't been done before, which was to figure out what has the clearance rate of this sheriff's office been over time? And was it, go is it going up? Is it going down? And so we, and that wasn't easy to find. And then when we found that and plotted it and I brought it to the sheriff, the sheriff didn't know his clearance rate. And that was like one of the first questions I asked him, do you know your clearance rate? And he said, no, but I'm guessing that you do. <laughs> <laughs> and so how can you fix a problem that you won't even acknowledge or analyze? Yeah. Um, I think was, was one of their, their biggest issues. And the other thing too is um, the media wasn't holding law enforcement accountable in the way that um, people might expect. I mean, every, there were a number, not just this case, but other sen really sensational type crimes where the, there's like something about crime like this, seduction of crime, where the story is so fascinating that that can occupy all the attention. And so that was happening with crime after crime in this place. Every one was its own unique mystery. And instead of people saying, hold on a second, how come like, like I read these cases in the news about other places where they have these crimes and they're solved. How come I live in a place, you know, thinking like there's a reporter might like, how come we live in a place where we don't ever see that or we rarely see that our big cases I get solved? Your story is a huge indictment of the media also because the Jacob, Jacob Wetterling case was gigantic. It was a huge national story. It was covered by everybody. How could every single journalist have missed the fact that the cops were screwing up the investigation? I mean, I think there were some optics. So like definitely people were working really hard on this case. I mean, this was a case that had thousands of volunteers. I mean, there were like news choppers. You could see people like on like, officers like on mounted, like mounted on like, like ATVs and horses going through the field. So it looked like a lot was happening and a lot was happening, but it, but no one, as far as we could tell, was asking the most basic questions. You know, did you talk to the neighbors? Did you search the crime scene? Did you look for people that had attempted similar crimes in the past? And instead it just became this kind of default story that we're all pretty familiar with, I think, you know, that, you know, the, the perfect crime, like the epic mystery, the tireless efforts of law enforcement, and that is just the default story, and, and who is this devious person? And then this thing started to happen where it was like, you'd see news coverage, oh, is it this person? Is it that person? Like, you know, and that started with the participation of law enforcement to really deeply damage some people's lives in this area. Um, and one of the most gratifying things from this whole process has been people all across the country like tweeting and emailing their clearance rates so that they get this larger point. And so if the media is not going to do it, at least the people in these communities can start to, um, you know, know what questions to ask and to, to want to be like, oh yeah, there's this thing, I can find this out and it, there's not, there's some problems with the data, but I can find this out on my own.
Well, let's talk a little bit about, in the spirit of David Fahrenthold, how you involved the public in your reporting. And because you did, Connie, you did that very consciously. What, how, you know, how did that help you? Does that bring in a lot of information that muddies your waters and makes it harder to move the story forward sometimes? Yeah. What would you tell this audience about the advisability and the disadvantages of going that route? Well, we're working on the second season on a different case now, and we absolutely do not plan on, uh, uh, we, what we plan on, this time having them all complete and then rolling them out. And then if information comes out, then we're in a better position to, to figure out how to deal with it. Because what happened with this podcast is we launched at the end of October. Um, and you know, we had, we had actually, we didn't set out to do a podcast. We, I work for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, which is the public broadcaster in Canada in the investigative unit. And we had actually set out to do a TV story for the national newscast. Um, and I think our original story was going to be two minutes or something. Um, and so we set out to interview uh, the RCMP officer who retired and to interview her sister and to try to track down the person that he named in the email. And we did all that. We went out there to do all of that. But while we were there and people in the community heard that we were there asking questions about Alberta, people started coming forward saying, did you, did you know that he wasn't the only one at the house that night, that a nephew was asleep in the back bedroom? And so then we tracked down that nephew and he said, it wasn't just me, my brother was there and he actually got up in the night to go to the bathroom. And then we tracked him down and he had never been interviewed by police and had never, and none of these people had ever been interviewed by anyone because uh, by any media because this, it, this, these stories have, have been largely underreported. Um, so what we ended up coming back with, like we had gathered a large chunk of it on this, this trip and realizing it's more than a two minute story, it's more than a 20 minute story that we decided to turn it into this podcast. Um, but even still, while we, when we started rolling it out, then we started hearing from people who were, were at the bar that night that Alberta, was, that Alberta went missing, and they remember seeing, you know, people, we had various stories of people remember her being, seeing leaving in a black truck or a green truck or, you know, but just people who, who started coming forward once this podcast started getting attention. And so it was difficult because we had four episodes in the can and then we were producing the other four episodes over eight weeks while it rolled out, um, which was really um, challenging. <laughs> I was saying never again in December. I was like, we're never doing. I'm never doing this again. <laughs> anyway, we're doing it again, but we're going to do it a little bit differently. <laughs> um, but I think that uh, I think that one of the things that kind of touches on the law enforcement thing is that um, you know people like you know obviously there's this RCMP officer who cared enough about this case to go to the media 27 years later when he's retired. Um, but I think that it's so important to understand the context in, in this particular story and about why people didn't go to law enforcement at the time. And it's this the history of the relationship between Indigenous people and the RCMP, which has been so fraught and there's so much mistrust. And, and so part of our podcast is kind of unpacking that and showing where that came from. And so for, um, I'm not sure if any of you have heard of residential schools, but that is a, is a really huge issue in Canada, and, it, and it's an issue in the United States as well. I think they were called Indian boarding schools. Um, but in Canada, for over 100 years, the government of Canada um, took 150,000 uh, Indigenous children from their homes and forced them to attend these residential schools. Kids as young as four years old were expected to, to leave home um, live in these boarding schools, not allowed to speak their language. Some of them um, were given new names. Some of them were given a number when they attended these residential schools. Their heads were shaved. They weren't allowed to practice their culture. They were, it was a, a policy designed to deal with the Indian problem and to, you know, the goal was the assimilation. Um, and it affected generations of families because they were forced to attend, um, but we now know that they experienced severe physical and sexual abuse in these residential schools. And uh, the Chief Justice in Canada has called, you know, residential schools and some of the other policies cultural genocide of Indigenous people. But the RCMP were the ones who were working with the government to actually take children from their homes. So the RCMP would show up at your house and grab your four-year-old and take them away, and you're not allowed to see them again. You're, you're sometimes allowed to visit, but there were some, some families who didn't see their children again for years. And, and so I think that it's important to understand that 
relationship that the RCMP had with Indigenous communities when you're asking why did they do such a bad job in Alberta's case or in the majority of the cases that we've been covering from Indigenous people or Indigenous women, they've, families have said they, they are dissatisfied with police investigations. And, and I think that for this community in particular, they were more willing to talk to me, probably because I'm an Indigenous person who understands and you know just has a familiarity it, more than they would talk to an RCMP officer, especially back in 1989. Right, but, right. Um, anyway, so, so they, they, were, they reached out to us throughout the podcast as well. And Terry, you actually put your email address on the website and said, email me if you know anything. Yep. So how many crazy people emailed you with ideas? Yeah, you, you, you're, you're going to get that. I think every reporter gets that. So I don't think it's unique to me. I, I, you just have to have some ability to sort but the other thing you have to be willing to do is sometimes people who sound absolutely lunatic can give you some of the best tips. I, 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 don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know. They can be totally insane and send you a great tip sometimes. So, um, yeah, it's so wild. You, you or give you, give you documents or something, you know. All right. Got to stay open. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about um, whether you felt you could trust the memories of people. These are all old, old cases. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, did you actually find uh, people giving you a lot of inaccurate information, not on purpose, but just because human beings are who we are? I can hardly remember the names of my children. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We won't quiz you. <laughs> um, old. I think, for, yeah, I think for us, I mean, that just spoke to this larger question of like, well, if you miss your opportunity, you know, to talk to the neighbors that night, you're just, I mean, the memory is going to get worse and worse and worse mm -hmm. over time. So, I mean, from our perspective, we weren't quite in that situation because we weren't looking to solve it, you know, so. Um, but you were still asking people about events that had transpired long, long ago. Right. And so one thing that was helpful, like there was a one a uh, father and a son who, um, they both lived on the same dead, the dead end road where, the, where Jacob Wetterling was abducted. And um, another reporter I work with, Curtis Gilbert, um, we got like an old city directory and he found all the people on that dead end road, or as many were, were still alive and asked them. And in that case, um, he did a lot of checking, as much checking as you can do about, you know, this. so this boy had said, now a man, that like months before, he had been approached and been basically chased by a man in a car on the same dead end road and that in fact he had, after Jacob Wetterling was abducted, like his friend who lives like a two minute walk away or two minute bike ride maybe away, that he called, like he had his dad call the police and they went and gave a statement to the FBI. So we talked to the dad and you know we did put in the podcast that there's a caveat of this has been a long time. And the, and the other thing too, I mean when you're reporting on an unsolved case, um, I mean, these are cases that law enforcement has failed to solve, but these are also cases that, because they failed to solve them, in a lot of cases, the file is not open to the public. Right. So you're stuck in this, right. the, like the cases you'd most want to hold law enforcement accountable are exactly the cases you can't peer into the file. I mean, now the, the case was, some of you may know this, but the case was solved um, about, in between us releasing that video and releasing the first episode of the podcast within a week or so. Um, so now we're waiting for the release of the file, so we'll know. Um, the killer confessed in between. And led the authorities to the remains. Right, yeah. right. Amazing. Um, talk a little bit about traumatizing and being careful yeah. not to re-traumatize the people whom you're speaking with. I know that was a big issue for you, Connie, yeah. and for you as well, Madeline. I, think. I, th I mean, I, I, we definitely tried to be careful. Um, I, don't, I hope that we, we were. I mean, it's, it's so difficult, right, because um, with all of these cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women, for many of them, the families had never been invited to speak to the media before or asked about their loved one. So I find that in general, people are always more than willing to talk and they want to talk. And, and Claudia has been waiting 27 years to talk about Alberta and about, she feels like it's not only, you know, it's an obligation for her because she was the, the last person, one of the last people to see her alive. Um, but you're asking people to kind of go back into what was the worst thing that ever happened to them. And for, again, for Indigenous people, I think that's in particular a very sensitive thing because of the misrepresentation of Indigenous people in the media in general in, in Canada, uh, which is often 
focusing on a crises or a conflict and and also just I mean we're not very well represented in newsrooms in Canada right there are a handful of, uh, of indigenous journalists um, at CBC really I mean you know there are certainly more in the north but uh, in the broadcast center so I feel like our perspectives um, haven't been very well represented so I think that that leads to a lot of uh, apprehension from families about talking about it but it's very difficult and I, I would love to hear your insights on how you guys uh, manage that and handle that I mean certainly with Claudia she felt like it was a positive experience for her because she's wanted to be t wanted to talk about Alberta for a really long time but we you know there was another sister who we reached out to at the beginning and I asked to you know if, if she would talk to us about Alberta and she she said no like it's too it's too hard I can't do it and after the podcast started rolling out, then she reached out again and she said, I, I want to talk now. I'm, I ready, I'm ready to talk. I want to be a part of it. But I know, like, like it, she cried within 10 seconds of us talking. Like, it was such an emotional interview for her. And I've, you know, maintained connections with the family and with all of the families of, of women's cases that I've reported on. I feel that's really important, um, not only to follow up on developments of the story, but also to be respectful of their stories and, and their truths. And, um, but it's, I know that it's a really hard thing for families. And, and yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I think being sensitive to that is one thing, but I, I'd like to, I'd love to hear how you guys handle that. Um, well, one of the first things I did was, well, the first thing I did before I even pitched the story was I called Jacob's mom, Patty, and said, like introduced myself and said, is there any reason, like I'm thinking about maybe doing some reporting on this investigation. And at this point, you know, it had been unsolved. Is there any reason like, that that would mess up the investigation? Like, I had no idea what was going on in the case. So I just, and she said, you know, go for it. Um, we'd welcome more reporting on it. Um, and beyond that, I think, I mean, this is the advantage of having a lot of time. We had a year. We have a team of reporters. Because sometimes what reporters are asking people to do is pathological. You know, like, I'm a stranger. Tell me your personal life, like right now. Like I'm calling you on the phone. Like this person won't ta talk to me. Like this is not a normal thing we're asking people to do. Um, and so, and we're also in this business where sometimes I think we are like demanding people trust us for no reason, um, rather than if you have some time, you can develop a relationship with someone where they, where you can prove to them as best you can that you are trustworthy. And so I think that having a year, um, not only to interview um, Jacob's family, but also um, the, there's many other people who have been sexually assaulted in this area, um, one of them for sure by the same person who kidnapped and murdered Jacob Wetterling, but a number of, of basically a town was terrorized by, an, by this man in the 80s. Um, and kids were like riding their bikes carrying knives and um, it was a, frightening, awful environment. And so having time so that people, um, like middle-aged men can have time to decide to talk to you or not, or that you can you know, talk to one person and it goes well and you're respectful, and then they can tell someone else. Um, and then people can actually decide, you know, because sometimes people will decide in the moment, but they really, like they feel pressured, you know, and, and so yes, it's a yes, but it's kind of not, really a yes, you know, or it's like a yes because you caught me and I'm being nice. So I think having time so that when we do those interviews, they can be more um, in-depth and, and be more meaningful. Um, just, ha just having time is important. And then being respectful of, you know, when you're in the interview that, you know, this is what we're going to talk, I think this is what we're going to talk about. And then constantly checking in, like, do, do you want to take a break? Should we stop here? Um, right. So that you're not just going so in a direction. I want to open up for questions. I want to add one last question first, though, which is just how you handled the unbelievable volume of material. So all of you were covering kind of immense, immense subjects. I love the fact, I read the detail that your timeline was 400 yeah. pages and it included the Lewis and Clark expedition. That was the first, that was the first century. It's first that was priceless. I mean, talk about comprehensive. You really were doing very voluminous reporting. So any thoughts about how you keep all that stuff straight? I love a good timeline, like you said. A good timeline. Mm -hmm. I just have a Word document, and it's really basic, and it started out with like one page. This is the date of the abduction. This is the date the sheriff was elected. Um, and then I just add to it, and it's kind of obvious, but it's just such a, it has helped me in so many projects, because you don't know an investigative project what is relevant when you start out. And uh, you know, to put things on a chronology, and so that 
you know, even when you put them on, you didn't even know that they mattered, then they mattered a great deal. In our case, it was critical because to be well organized and to have this timeline because of the confession. So when this man confessed to the crime and we were basically done and trying to figure out, well, now what do we do? Um, the fact that we basically just did a control F out of this like many hundreds pages timeline and created like a Danny Heinrich, the person who did it, timeline of like 40 pages from that, but then also saw the, his stuff in relation to the other stuff. And you know, if we hadn't have been organized in that way, we probably would have to say, well, like we're gonna take another year and get back to you. Which would have been bad. That would have been bad. Yes. Uh, I, I guess I realized early in this, in the Fields Dale story, and, and I haven't done other cold cases too. Um, I, I just started, and I've done it with some of the other ones. I just keep a journal. And so I dump, I start dumping things in it. Dump emails, I dump conversations. I mean, everything. I, I, I write down, if I'm talking with someone, you know, uh, a member of the family, you know, it would not be anything I'd put in a regular story, but it might be something I'd come back and use in narrative, which is what I did. In the final narrative, actually, I became a character. I mean, not because I was trying to be a character, but I, I think the narrative demanded it. And so I had all that. Uh, I also had, a, I had 2,400 pages of his journals. I was gonna say, you were so helped by, it was a serial killer who kept a diary. Yeah, <laughs> I know, imagine yeah. that. Yeah, what are we gonna and, do uh, in the internet age? So I had, but it was all handwritten, so what I did is I went through, I spent, I can't tell you how many different weekends, literally typing it because there wasn't any way to scan it or convert it, and I would sometimes, he would a lot of times mention names, which I was always interested in, sometimes first names, but then sometimes he would give a last name. And so I was interested, so in order to keep track of all that, I literally took the journal, and I didn't do every single word, but the important parts of it, I converted into text, so that it gave me time, places, dates, people, et cetera, those kind of things. I thought, Connie, one of the most powerful things on your website is just the incredible scroll through the hundreds and hundreds yeah, of women. Names. You just can't believe it as yeah. you're going through it. And yeah. that, that represented a lot of work, being sure enough about each of those murders and putting them together. Yeah, and we actually at CBC News, we did a thing on Twitter where we um, posted a, a, one of the profiles and a picture of the women, um, I think it was every six minutes for two days of all wow. the women in our database. Like, I mean, just so, and then people who are following, like you just, you get the sense of just how large it is. But in terms of managing the information, um, I work with a really talented producer who should be sitting up here with me, um, Marty Luke, who is really incredibly organized and has all sorts of Google folders and files that help us. And one of the things that you talked about having a journal is that the RCMP officer who came forward, um, he actually, also then allowed us to use his police right. notebooks and to view his police notebooks. Because even after you retire from the RCMP, you're allowed to keep your notebooks in case that you, you ever have to testify in an unsolved case, which um, I'm sure there's a, a million rules that he broke in sharing them with us, uh, but he agreed to do that. Um, so ag again, it was this, it is notebooks from 1989 and every notation that he had made about Alberta's case, which was including interviews with suspects and interviews with family members, um, but also details that, you know, he didn't remember that, you know, in the course of our reporting, we realized could potentially be significant. Like, you know, how a week before her body was found, they found bloody clothes somewhat matching the description of what she was wearing, um, but that they didn't necessarily make a connection that those could have been Alberta's clothes. And we were like, do they still exist? Are they still in an RCMP box somewhere? And, and we don't, I mean, he's retired now, and so we don't necessarily have that information, but we did the same thing where we were, there was ha chicken scratch that we tried to decipher and, and can, and also write a, t write a timeline. Like you go out on these, uh, in the field and, and you're talking to different people and you have all the tape, but I find it really helpful then to go back and remember um, the context. So this happened right before there or something, you know, something that you know you're not gonna use but will help jog your memory later when you're trying to recall because uh, I think especially with podcasts and this kind of storytelling, a lot of it is your personal journey throughout and for this podcast, it ended up being quite personal for me and so a large part of it is my personal story so it's helpful to manage it in that way. Can we take some questions from the audience? Janice, am I allowed to do that yet? Yeah. Uh, when we think about who's 
missing status and who, which victims get coverage in the news, mm -hmm. it's not the Albertas. Right. Yep. No, I, I pitched my first MMIW story actually 10 years ago when I was working for the National Broadcaster when a girl that I knew from back home had gone missing. And it was the same summer that a, a white blonde woman went missing from Toronto area. And her name was Alicia Ross. And her disappearance was covered on our national newscast, uh, every national newscast that we have three in, in Canada, um, and on the cover of the national newspapers. And I heard about Amber's disappearance, the girl that I knew from, from Saskatchewan, um, because of an email chain that her mom had started saying, she's missing and can, can you guys help spread the word? Like there wasn't even a local story done. And so when I pitched the story to my producer at the time and I asked, you know, that I wanted to not just talk about Amber's disappearance, but just compare the two, like there were so many similarities between them. They were two young, beautiful women whose families were like desperate to find them and who had such bright futures ahead of them. And my producer at the time stopped me and she said, this isn't another poor Indian story, is it? And, and that was it. And, that, and that, was, that was the end of it. And that was 10 years ago. So it wasn't actually that long ago. But now I have to say that I, for the last three years, I've basically been dedicated to telling the stories of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Uh, I'm a part of a, 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 an Indigenous, CBC Indigenous is a, a, a unit, a digital unit that's focused on telling stories from Indigenous communities in Canada. It's not just CBC in Canada. The, every national broadcaster is now making these stories a priority. A national inquiry has been called into the disappearance of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And so there's been this huge transformation in the last three years. And I think it's been the shift to digital and to digital um, storytelling that has really pushed that forward because, you know, we now have like numbers that show you, oh, people are interested in these stories, whereas before we were just making those decisions in rooms by ourselves. Now we actually have metrics that show, oh, this is widely shared, and we have access to a community that is not necessarily represented in our newsrooms through social media. So I think, I think things are improving. And, and to the point, the case you mentioned, uh, which was James Cheney, who is African American from Mississippi, and Mickey Schwerner, and Andy Goodman, who are both white, uh, Jewish from New York, um, Rita Schwerner has said it herself, which was, if they hadn't been white, if this had just been some black kids, mm -hmm. right, killed, it wouldn't have been, na in, you know, national news, ev every major newspaper uh, uh, reported completely around the world. Uh, and they were missing for 40, 44 days. So, yeah, it has everything to do with, with, with that, unfortunately. So. No question. Yeah, way in the back there. Hi. Um, I guess I'll stay. Hey, y'all. I'm Sierra Manny, and um, I'm with Reveal at the Center for Investigative Reporting. And I'm also from Mississippi. Um, I guess my question is for you, Mr. Mitchell. Um, you say that you don't use narrative very often in your stories, which I think it's funny just because stories about the South so often do. Oh, sometimes yeah. to the point of sounding like Faulkner novels. I feel like it's kind, yeah. of, kind of crazy. I know. Um, and I guess <laughs> as, uh, as, as a white man writing about race in Mississippi um, and your newsroom, like so many other newsrooms, not having black people to lead, talk, have those narratives themselves, um, is that like an intentional thing? How does that serve, I guess, the stories where you write so much about the suffering of families impacted by racism? Um, What's, what's the, uh, you're, I'm not I sure like what the question how does, is. How does, using, or how does using narrative or not using narrative serve, I guess, those stories about such oh. traumatic incidences? Well, I think, I think they're incredibly valuable. I've probably done about a half dozen, you know, major narratives. Um, and I think they help to tell those stories. I, I, it, I mean, it, I did one, the first one that I did uh, was called Preacher and a Klansman. It was a story about John Perkins, who, uh, African-American preacher who got involved in the civil rights movement, and Tommy Terrence, who was a Klansman involved in all this violence, uh, and the end of the story is they become friends. And so I wanted to tell that story, and I thought, I, I love the idea of doing a narrative and telling it in a serial narrative form, but I'll never forget the email I got from this guy, who was a 58-year-old doctor 
in the Mississippi Delta White Doctor, and he said to me when he wrote me, it made me realize the power of narrative, he said, I never really realized what African Americans went through until I read your story. And I'm like, what rock has this guy been living under, <laughs> you know? But it lets you know the power of story, the power of narrative, the power of, of characters uh, and telling those stories. And, and you're right about the South. We, uh, we love our stories. So. Any other questions? Y'all are a little soporific uh, after yeah, lunch. Yeah. Hi, Diana Henriquez, uh, contributing writer with the New York Times. Um, you all used a different, a, a sort of different medium. And a lot of us are longtime print people, um, and uh, as you are, Jerry. But I'd, I'd like to hear from each of you why the medium you chose was the right way to tell this story. Were there elements of other media that you wove in? How did you use the different forms of our craft? Right between print, video, pod, audio, all of those uh, fundamental building blocks. How did you use them and how did you decide, how did you use them and how did you choose them, really? Um, um, Good. Oh, Good. Oh, sorry, so when I did one of our, the first um, MMIW stories that we did was a television doc um, and I, I listened to Serial right before we went out to do that shoot and the whole time we were there, I remember thinking this should be a podcast because um, especially with stories like Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, um, it's really the context or the bigger picture that's the story. Like, you're, you, like in all of these stories, uh, like you can focus on the individual, but you really need to provide the context to people to show how, and to connect the dots and show how, um, we, you know, what made Alberta Williams or Leah Anderson or Amber Tucker or any of the other women that we've done stories on, um, how their lives have been shaped by this collective history in Canada of Indigenous people. And I felt like for so much of our reporting on that, it, it was we would do all of the research, we would do all of the reporting, and then at the end we would compile it and we would say, CBC News has learned X, Y, or Z, and it would be a, a TV doc. And I feel like um, doing it as a podcast really allowed us to, to be transparent about the process and to be... Um, you know, to, to tell it in a, in a more experimental way in terms of including my own personal narrative and part of it, and it's about my journey and finding out about Alberta, um, but also allowed us to provide, to, do, to provide the context that's so important for people to begin to understand where these issues are coming from and to connect the dots between residential schools and colonization and, and this issue and the impacts of child welfare and, and the interaction. So, um, and also, I just, I, I've worked in television for so long, um, I, this was actually the first time I'd done a radio doc, which, uh, forgive me for the first few, for, for those of you who do it, you can tell, I'm sure, in the first few episodes, because um, there's not a lot of natural sound, uh, but, uh, but, I, but it's just really exciting to be working in, in a different format that I haven't, haven't done for a while. It also builds suspense. I think one of you mentioned how you know the yeah. podcasting thing is a naturally suspenseful or can be yeah. way of stringing along a story. Did you want to add something, Jerry? Uh, just uh, real quick, uh, we you know we I decided to do the narrative. I think I kind of mentioned that before that I just felt like it was the best way to tell the story because um, I remember the the mother who called me and we had a later conversation and I said just give me the five minute version which I've now realized is a great question to ask people to do, you know, because it forces them to tell you the story, the, the guts of the story, in a lot close, you know, quick way of saying it. So when she told me that version, I was like, that's how to tell the story. And so we did the, we did the narrative, uh, 9,000 words, eight page section paper with all the photos that we gathered. And we had, we had audio, uh, we created actually an iBook that had uh, audio, video, and uh, video, uh, audio interviews, video, went out on the river where she, where she drowned and, and all those kind of things. Um, the, the brother had never even knew where she drowned and went out with him and, and different things like that. So we had all that for the first one. Uh, then when we came back, and I of course kept reporting on this, when we came back at the very end, I had been pushing USA Today Network to do a documentary. And so we actually did a documentary. They did a whole website. So if you go on USA, 
either you can go on, well, the easiest one probably to tell you is clarionledger.com slash gone, G-O-N-E. And it's got, it's a very nice website. They did it all. I didn't do anything. And uh, <laughs> thank God. And, uh, and, and so they did it. We, uh, Steve, uh, Steve Elfers uh, did the documentary. He's done other documentaries and stuff like that. And I, if we had had time, not that I know anything about podcasting, we would have done a podcast too because I have 12 hours of this guy talking on mm. audio, not video, but audio. So, yeah, it's, uh, so that's what dictated time. You know, we didn't have time to do a podcast too, but we didn't know how to do one, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For us, it was just this, this story. Um, so at a certain point in the reporting, what is the best way? And for us, the reason why a podcast was the best way, um, like I've done a radio documentary before, like an hour long documentary. So your options in radio, four minute piece, eight minute piece, maybe a little longer, hour long documentary, I've been a print reporter. It just seemed like the best way, to, the most responsible way to tell this story. It's a complicated story. It goes over decades. It's to tell it in a multi-part series. And then when we look at that, what's the way, what's the most effective way to do that? Well, right now, the most effective way to do that is podcasts. And you're not beholden to, like in public radio, the clock. Like You right. can have one episode that's 25 minutes, another that's 45 minutes. But I also think that um, there's something about... Every medium has its pros and cons, but for radio or for audio, um, there's something about just having the whole experience. Like you're listening, you're not, like unlike when you go to watch a movie, you're not watching the movie, you're not listening to a podcast with other people. You are being talked to directly. Like this is a solo experience. And there's something I think about the intimacy of that mm -hmm. experience um, that can be very effective for making people care and can help a lot in building empathy. And this is the most, this is the oldest way we tell stories, right. to just tell you a story. And there have been so much TV coverage of Jacob too, and so much visual uh, noise and cacophony yeah. around the Jacob Wetterling case. And there is something quieter about the podcast medium that <coughs> is, has a greater, there's a lot of undignified coverage of Jacob, a lot of wrong coverage, a lot of bad coverage. Mm -hmm. I just want to say something that has nothing to do with any of the rest of what we're talking about. I just want to say it before we get out of here, which mm -hmm. is I just feel honored to be with you guys on stage. I just, you guys are such incredible talents. And I have to say too to everybody here, and I know you're here for this reason, is that I believe that investigative reporting is one of the most noble professions in this world. And I'm so honored to be with all of you. And I just want to let you know that before I leave. And David and others that are here that I know, Rosie. And uh, we're doing, doing great work, you know? And, and I love it, you know? Yeah.